Well, good afternoon. If you are in New York City or Southern Ohio or Northern Minnesota or places further south in the Americas, good evening to people listening all around the world. Good morning to those of you listening in the morning. Special love to our loved ones in Ukraine. We're with you. We send you love and strength and music and what all the good things that music can provide. Welcome to Fred Plotkin on Fridays on Idajo, the place where classical music happens. Idajo is a video and audio streaming platform dedicated to supporting artists and to making classical music and opera available to music lovers all around the world. As regular visitors to this program know, which has now been more than two years, I like to have people on in the music business who we may know personally, we may have seen in performance, but also many people who do crucial things in our business that make it possible for singers to sing, performers to perform, artists to art, if that's a verb. And today I have Linda McAllister, who is the executive director of Schmidt Vocal Arts. Welcome, Linda. You are in Ohio, in Southern Ohio. I am, actually in Northern Kentucky. At the Northern moment. Kentucky. <laughs> All right, yes. so back in June, I had Chris Milligan on. Chris is the executive director yeah. of the mm -hmm. Cincinnati Opera. And I've done a lot of stuff for that company through the years. And for people who don't know, there is the Ohio River. And the Ohio River separates the state of Ohio from the state of Kentucky, at least in that part of the world. There's a bridge that's always threatening to come tumbling down that connects the two sides. <laughs> and um, there's a baseball stadium right there at the river. Cincinnati is a very vibrant city and the community across the way is called Covington, Kentucky. And the airport is CVG for Covington. And there are a lot of restaurants there right along the river on that side where many Cincinnatians do. Well, let's put it this way. Historically, people from Cincinnati could go do things in Covington they could not do in Cincinnati. Do I elegantly put that? That, that is a very good way to put it. In fact, there are some some historical tours, I think, that take place where they point out a few a few of those special places where people visited. Yes. But isn't it also <laughs> Newport, Kentucky is actually the town where that really, really happened, whatever yeah. happened. Yeah. I, I live in, I live in the less seedy part of northern Kentucky, historically wise, okay. Covington. <laughs> and I'm suddenly forgetting the name of the specialty meat product that's found there, goatee. Oh, goatee. Get, a, get a sausage. Get a, get a, get a, but it's the sausage that has oats in it or something it unusual. Does. It's yeah, all, German the, all the, German, the German immigrants who were yeah. here, they they kind of um, founded that because they needed a filler for the meat. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, you know, I grew to love it. I'm not originally from here, but now, now I'm a Geta fan. I grew to love it too. I didn't initially because the sensation of pork spices and oats was a bit odd, but it actually mm -hmm. is very good. It's, it's grilled in a pan and served with eggs, and it's it's actually yeah. very good. Mm -hmm. So you're from Minnesota, correct? I am. Where yeah. in Minnesota? I grew up in a really small town called Hector, Minnesota. It's got a whopping 1,000 people a part of it. It's about two hours west of the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul. So my often my favorite composer is Hector Berlioz, Hector Berlioz. How did the town get to be named Hector? <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. that, well, the, the, I remember the one story from when I was young where it was like someone was climbing over a fence and he said, heck, I tore my pants. And then it was that. <laughs> but I doubt that's the story, but that's the one that- That's Minnesota humor. Yeah. <laughs> I live for a year in Minneapolis, so I know Minnesota <laughs> you. I love the I love Minnesota actually. Yeah. Um, so tell me, if you were a high school girl in a small town in Hector, Minnesota, <laughs> when, how, and why did you find your voice as a singer and perhaps as a as a young woman? Well, um, it, I found music before singing, for sure. Um, my dad's a farmer, but my mom grew up in the city. So she was a, a St. Paul uh, youth and took music lessons there. 
And um, when my sister and I were born, she really decided that she wanted us to have a musical education. So I was lucky enough to have uh, a private teacher in two towns over, which was slightly bigger than Hector, uh, where I had a violin and a piano teacher, same person. What was the and name of that town? Um, Olivia, Minnesota. That's the county. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Were all the towns their name for people? Um, no, the one in between is Bird Island. So, <laughs> <laughs> but a couple of them, yeah. So, and what grew um, on your father's farm? I want to know that. Uh, when I was very young, we had pigs. So we had a pig farm and had um, sugar beets and corn and soybeans. And then probably since I was in first grade, which is many moons ago, um, just corn and soybeans. And corn my dad soy. just retired last year at the age of 87. Wow. wow. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I have deep respect for farmers. People know me maybe for music, but other people know me from my food side. And I've yeah. spent a great deal of time on farms and in the world of agriculture. And it's it's something I have immense respect for and admiration, not only because it's hard, but because it's essential. And, you know, people say, well, pigs or sugar beets or soybeans or corn, these are fundamentals for sustenance of the whole world. And as much as music, I see music as sustenance, but I see, you know, they're glamorous foods. There's arugula, whatever you want to say, that might grow in limited seasons to be put on menus in Minneapolis. But the food that supports the world are those sugar beets and, and corn and soybeans especially. So that's really wonderful. Did you grow up eating farm food? Did your mother cook more um, Twin Cities food? How did you, how you nourish that way? Well, um, if my mom's going to watch this, she's probably going to be upset that when I said she wasn't the best cook That's okay, <laughs> growing <no> up. <laughs> but we had a lot of Minnesota hot dishes, which is like the casserole, noodles, cream of something soup. Mm -hmm. And then, and of course, when we had our pig farm, uh, we had a lot of pork. So yeah. I, I probably had um, grilled pork chops from very young age on and got totally sick of them for about 20 years. And now I like them again. So... <laughs> Well, no wonder Geta was an acquired taste for you in the. I know, in, right? In <laughs> okay, so when you were finding yourself as a musician, did your sister as well study music? Yes. Uh, so she also. We kind of had the same route. Started with violin. Um, she's two years older than I am, and then went to piano. At, so violin at three years old, piano at five. We both played flute as well. And then she really took off in violin. And I um, kind of started noticing that I was better at singing. So mm -hmm. I added uh, private voice lessons to my repertoire. So I was in my sophomore year of high school, I was taking four different private lessons, singing in choirs. And um, yeah, I decided that would be my primary instrument from then on, even though I did um, study a little bit of piano in college as well. Part of why I'm bringing this up is because people who are not familiar with certain parts of the United States, and by that I mean the upper Midwest, which is Minnesota, Wisconsin, where I went to university, Iowa, um, to Michigan, but also Ohio, Indiana, Illinois. These are all states that have very great musical traditions. The schools, especially, I would say, Indiana and Michigan, are very, very famous internationally for the quality of their vocal arts instruction. Um, Ohio is full of conservatories mm -hmm. and small opera companies and the university you're at that I'm gonna talk about in a moment. And it is very common for people in rural Minnesota to sing and be part of choirs, especially because of the Scandinavian tradition. Mm -hmm. That is part of you look Scandinavian, but your name is McAllister. Sorry, there's a siren going by. Um, yeah. Yes, name is McAllister, Scotch Irish. I okay. look I look more Scandinavian now um, as I get older and blonder. So, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> mostly, <Like Hillary German. laughs> mostly German, Scotch Irish, though. Got it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> also, great singing <laughs> traditions, but yes. no, it's important because what 
do people in rural parts and especially agricultural parts of the country do at night, especially if they're part of churches? I'm making this distinction, say, from the state of Oklahoma and Texas also, which have very strong musical traditions and many great singers have come out of both of those states. I would say for its size, Oklahoma produces a phenomenal amount of great singers. With them, it's in part the church tradition and also the African-American church tradition. There are fewer African-Americans in Minnesota, mm -hmm. but the choral tradition of the Germans, wherever that appears, so certainly Ohio, and certainly Wisconsin, and to some degree, Illinois, but also um, all the other populations that emigrated there in the 1840s and 1850s, so that these singing traditions, these choral traditions, go back 150 years or more, almost 200 years at this point. And so that, therefore, it's not anomalous that someone in Hector, Minnesota, would be very engaged in music, even if she grew up on a farm. Mm -hmm. With that said, talk about the Schmidt Vocal Arts Program, what it is, who it attracts, namely high schoolers, which I think is wonderful and fascinating. And then we'll talk about how you find them and what they do in your program. Yes, so Schmidt Vocal Arts, we are basically a family foundation uh, with the sole mission to, to help young singers pursue their passion in music. So uh, it was started first as a competition uh, mm -hmm. about 25 years ago. Our founder, Bill Schmidt, William E. Schmidt, is, um, has now since passed away, but he was a longtime supporter of the arts of youth education uh, and he spent his final years in Sarasota, Florida, but he grew up in rural Kentucky and then in Evansville, Indiana. And with the help of his sister, Anna Lee Hamilton, uh, she was a classical singer and um, Bill, Bill did really well in business and, and decided to start this foundation and his sister, kind of helped him um, form a plan to uh, help young singers. So it started out with one competition in Indiana um, where Anna Lee would go around and see uh, different voice teachers in the state and ask them to um, high school kids to come compete. Um, there was also, they sponsored a prize for high school singers at the now um, uh, a competition that doesn't happen anymore, the McAllister Awards, no mm -hmm. relation to me, um, but that was in Indianapolis and, and Bill um, supported the high school uh, awards there. And then uh, the foundation decided they wanted to grow a little bit from there. So uh, for a number of years, the competition was, um, was administered through the University of Kentucky. And then for a number of years through Miami University of Ohio. Uh, that's when I came on board to the Schmidt team. And then in the summer of 2019, the foundation decided to become their own entity uh, with employees and everything, and we became Schmidt Vocal Arts. And that's when we really um, decide, or really started growing a lot program-wise, program scholarship-wise. Uh, and then the pandemic hit um, in my first year as executive director. Yeah. Um, but we pivoted quickly. We didn't stop um, offering programs for kids. Um, we, in fact, added more programming. Uh, what is now the competition? We had uh, we have 16 regional competitions across the country and now a live um, national competition as well every year. And during the pandemic, we offered our first undergraduate competition for singers, which had such a huge response that in the in the following year, we doubled the amount of singers who could be in that. And um, we also have a summer program uh, every year at Miami University of Ohio. It's called the Schmidt Vocal Institute, and that that in, includes about 30 singers from across the country, really high level talented high school singers where they come and work with the Miami University voice faculty and then also uh, work with a rotating list of guest artists. So this past summer we had um, Professor William Burden, a tenor from the Juilliard and Manis School. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, Kayo Iwama from the Bard Conservatory and then Dr. Catherine Jolly from Oberlin. 
mm. uh, conservatory. So they came uh, for two weeks, took lessons, coachings. We got to see a performance of Love OM at Cincinnati Opera because we partner with them on a few events. So that that really is that that program is near and dear to my heart because um, I I. I started planning that in about 2016, so it's still fairly new. So um, yes. I'm, I'm going to interrupt there because there was a lot you've already brought out for yeah. us to talk about. Um, I realized in your narrative that I met William E. Schmidt in Sarasota, really? but I did not. Schmidt is a common enough name that I didn't connect mm -hmm. it until you explained that. But of course, yeah, yeah. wonderful man. He, um, he does, for sure. Yeah. Sarasota Opera, for people who don't know, is a wonderful company in Florida that really specializes in Giuseppe Verdi and was the first company, certainly in the Americas and maybe only Parma, is the only other place that has done the entire canon of Giuseppe Verdi. So uh, Verdi lovers, myself among them, tend to congregate in Sarasota also because it's lovely in February when they have their season and the rest of the nation is freezing. <laughs> But um, I'm particularly, I'm captivated by everything you said, but particularly by the concept of a high school institute. Mm -hmm. And I'll explain why. Um, I, my life was changed 50 years ago this year, we're in 2022, when I was admitted to the National High School Institute at Northwestern University. And it was called the Cherub Program because at that point we had cheeks that were cherubic. So we were all cherubs. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And at Northwestern University, the cherubs were treated with such beautiful care by the campus because they saw us as an investment that if you capture us at the right moment, you can form us for life. And I will say that I was more formed by that than I was by my university education. And as it's 50 years, many of us have reached out to one another from the chair program we've kept in touch. And there was something about capturing us at 16, 17 years old that made such an impact on the people we became. Now, I was doing, I had the choice of theater, speech, and journalism, and I combined all three in effect, becoming broadcasting. I was allowed to be mentored at the Lyric Opera of Chicago. That was the first opera company I worked at. Uh, later, Artis Kranich, who became the head of the company, became my mentor and guided me for the rest of her life. And I worked for her a lot. And, and so all of that happened that summer. And I had no notion when I got on the plane from New York to Chicago that how my life would change by that. And there's something remarkable if you have a motivated or open high school student and he or she is with others who are comparably motivated and let's say whether or not they're having real life teenage problems at home and we know a lot of what those are it's not just about puberty and development it's about crime it's about social media nowadays it's about all the things that can distract and upset and perplex teenagers, and it's hard enough be, being an adolescent, that if you have motivated young people, as you do in your program, it's really getting them at a crucial moment in their lives. Do you, and I'm, when I say you, I mean you personally, but also your program and the people who work in it, to what degree in your selection process, to what degree in your sense of gathering the people you gather do you think about not just the program but about their future oh that comes in it, it a lot uh, i i don't only look at the voice i look at if i've met the person already sometimes at our competitions the personality uh, you can get an idea of how they might work uh, with someone. Sometimes I do Zoom auditions and then I, I will work with the singer just a little bit to see how they react to that. Um, you know, I, my board gave me this uh, task when I became executive director, a lofty goal that they wanted every American classical singer to go through one of our programs at some point in mm -hmm. their early careers. And I told them they have to give me many decades for that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but I think 
that for a singer to have this experience at that age, it's so important. Um, I always tell them the first day, you know, these are people you're going to probably cross paths with in five years, 10 years. They might be the person hiring you in 20 years, you know? Mm -hmm. So I know, I know not all of them are going to end up being professional singers, but my goal and the program's goal is to have them come away with number one, a love for music or a continued love for music, a continued love for singing that I, you know, they, whether or not they go on to study voice at the university level, mm -hmm. they will have that for the rest of their lives. Um, I, one example, we have one singer who uh, attended our Schmidt Vocal Institute in 2021. So uh, a little over uh, in last season. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he decided he was going to go to Harvard and mm -hmm. study physics or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, he knows who he is, who I'm, who, if he's listening. Yeah. Um, and, and that was his, and he's gonna study music along the way, but um, he really wanted to explore that part of it too. He has an amazing voice. He has an amazing passion for singing. And um, when I first saw him perform, I immediately was drawn into his, into his stage presence and his charisma. And I think that's gonna transfer to whatever he does, whether he's on stage or um, a senator or, <laughs> or, or a physician. Yeah. Well, you know, many of our finest singers, and I say not our, I don't mean America, I mean the world of opera, um, did, quote, very serious educations. Anthony Roth Costanzo went to Princeton and did a very rigorous study at Princeton. Simon Keenly side, the great British baritone, went to Cambridge, and I forget if he studied zoology or anthropology or something like that, that does not immediately point to an opera career. Uh, Devon Tynes went to Harvard, and Leonard Bernstein went to Harvard, and a lot of these people do serious study. I always tell young artists who ask me for advice, study other things in addition. I was a history major knowing I was going to opera but I was a history major because I felt that would help my understanding of any opera that I had to approach and the history behind a song. It requires you to learn languages. It requires you to know that Wagner and Verdi were born during a European revolution and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, history for me is fundamental. For other people, it may be visual arts, it may be languages. It may be chemistry. It, it could be any of those things. But I think music and the study of music underpins being a better student. Oh, I 100% agree with that. Yeah, even for me personally, I mean, I was always the the overachiever in, in all years of my study. And I I credit my my early music study for my work ethic, my the fact that you can memorize things. I mean, you do it at an early age and and I look at the kids that um, do it now and, and the ones that had earlier study, they definitely have an advantage. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm sticking now with the high schoolers. We can get to other levels, but there are other programs that do other levels. But high school is it's precocious because, number one, many of the kids have not settled into their voices yet, for starters. Mm -hmm. And repertory that you may ask them to prepare. I know that you may have an Italian song, an aria, German lead, uh, an American song, operetta or other music. Part of this interpretation is not just having the notes and the breath control and the technique, but engaging with the text. And in the case of an opera aria, also being in the moment that the character is experiencing when she's singing whatever she's singing. Mm -hmm. um, at 16 and 17, many of these young people have not, thankfully, not yet had the life experiences that go into these songs and these arias. Do they bring the songs that they've picked? Do you provide a list of recommended songs? Do you, when you audition them or hear them via Zoom, say, you know, this song might be a good one for you, consider it? How does that work? 
So it begins with actually the singer and their teacher, their private teacher. So once I accept a singer into the Institute, they get a, a repertoire questionnaire. So um, we have five categories of, that they need to prepare that Italian aria, the German lead and, and um, a couple others. And I send this questionnaire off, they talk to their teacher and then they give me three suggestions in each of those categories. And then from there, I usually pick um, the pieces, number one, so I don't have 30 kids all singing the same Schubert song. Right. Um, and, <laughs> and, then, and then it's easier for me to plan our classes that we have with the guest faculty. So we would mm -hmm. maybe have a, a class only on Schubert or only on American song. So uh, when I do the final selections, I have those pieces in mind for our classes. I'm going to tell a story because I'd like to see your reaction to the story. Okay. Um, I, a number of years ago, which is to say pre-pandemic, taught a master class on Mozart at a very famous Ivy League university in the United States. Uh, there are only eight of those, so take your pick. Mm -hmm. And um, the class was on Mozart. The singers were all instructed to bring a Mozart aria that I would work with them on, and it could be in Italian or German, it didn't quite matter, or French for those few that he did in French. Um, it didn't quite matter, but just that it had to be Mozart. A young man who happened to be a tenor, but we're gonna leave that, arrived and said, I brought today Una Fortiva Lagrima from Elisir d'Amore by Donizetti. And I said, why? He said, well, because I sound good in that. And I said, but this is a class on Mozart. Now I, without preparation, could work with you on that aria, but part of your career, young man, is that you have to learn to bring what's asked for. If then on the side you want to work Donizetti. I'm a big believer in Donizetti. And on another occasion, we could do that. And I did not want to hurt his feelings. But I said, you can sing the aria, but we're not going to work on it. I know you brought it, we can sing it. But I came today to do Mozart. And in this case, I didn't ask in advance for what the kids were bringing, because I could do whatever it was. And but how would you have reacted in that situation where a young tenor, let's say, but it could be anyone, um, just doesn't bring what's assigned? How do you how do you deal with that? I think it really depends on the circumstance. In your case, when there's maybe an audience, I would have handled it probably exactly the same way. Funny enough, in our like in our repertoire questionnaires. You know, I ask kids to suggest American song and I get a lot of quilter and Finzi suggestions, okay. which obviously are not American, <laughs> but yeah, I know. Um, if I if I get enough of those suggestions from British composers, then I plan a British class and it ends up yeah. working out. So um, I think at that age, you know, I I tend not to go back and say, hey, you know, this really isn't an American composer, can you come up with other ones? They've obviously talked about it with someone and I try and work around it. I mean, it, if it were totally inappropriate repertoire, that would be another thing. But, mm -hmm. you know, young singers singing quilter songs, I think is is totally fine. Um, in a live situation like that, <laughs> I, I applaud you for how you handled it. I think that was probably the best way to go. Well, I wanted to give him his moment to sing. Yeah. And he did pretty well. There were things I would have addressed, but he did he did it pretty well. But the point really was that if you're going to be in a profession, I learned this very early on when I was studying Spanish in junior high school. And the teacher said, you're going to get a five question test, take out a pencil and write down the following answers. There were five questions. I was the only person who passed the test not because I knew the right answers. I was the only person who took out a pencil not a pen <laughs> really and her lesson mrs cherry mrs cherry's lesson was you really have to listen and if you're going to make it in life it's the details it's the paying attention that matters and it was just my producing a pencil that enabled me to pass 
And I'm saying this not because it's the right thing to be rigorous. And especially when you're dealing with very young people with high schoolers or early college, where they're still forming their identities themselves and so on. You don't want to humiliate them. You don't want their feelings to be hurt, but you do have to communicate rigor because that's what's required in our profession. It should be required in all professions, but it is what's required in our profession. And I, I like to stress with them in our first day orientation, the importance of professionalism. And I, I tell these high school kids, 15 to 18 year olds, I will treat you like a professional. Um, and I want you to treat me like a professional and all of your colleagues. Um, but then along with that, I think it's super important to keep in your mind. Yes, it's a 15 year old. Uh, sometimes when they sing, you forget that because they're so good. And I just, uh, you know, I think it's uh, just really important to always treat them all with kindness, even if you're giving them a critique about how they're singing. Um, because, you know, with the last few years being what they are, I think, um, it's it's kind of a different world we're stepping into when we're coming back to live events and not having the camera in front of us um, mm -hmm. as a barrier for when you're singing for an audience. It's 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 another step to make yourself vulnerable again to an audience and and kindness goes a long way. So you raised another topic that I hadn't thought of, but it's an absolutely spot on question that I need to ask you. I have worked with very young people still in their teens, and occasionally someone is just so good and developed and ahead of all the others. And I'll name two that I worked with when they were teenagers, Nadine Sierra and Danielle Denise, now world-class sopranos. But when I met them, they were not yet 20, but so clearly ahead of all the others that the tendency number one is to try to work with them because you really see talent and, and potential there. But number two, um, it must be awful for the other kids in a way to see two people who are so naturally gifted and prepared. How do you deal with the inevitable gaps in, in progress and in maturity that you have among your high school students? You know, the amazing thing about our program is that oftentimes I do not see the competitive nature in this program. There are there are obviously, you know, the quote unquote stars of the program, the ones, you know, that might end the concert and and get to sing the harder repertoire. But to see how all of the 30 kids work together and become friends and num and so support each other when they perform and see their colleagues perform the applause that everyone gets is just unbelievable um so i think in in ours in this age group we don't see the the kind of fighting for things as much as you do once you get to even an undergraduate level. Oh, yeah. I think that's one of the reasons why I love working with this age is mm -hmm. that they still have that. Uh, they're not jaded yet. Um, they still have a really a, a great sense of wonder and exploration and, and willingness to learn. Um, you know, they're not set in their ways yet and and they're they're going from teacher to teacher and getting different ideas and then giving we give them the license to make a musical decision which as a teenager you know sometimes you don't get and um for a lot of these kids i think you know that support is is integral to their entire experience i know you know, in my in my small town, we actually did have other musicians. I wasn't mm -hmm. the only one who like went on to pursue music. But for, you know, some of these kids coming from other areas, they might be the only person in their school who likes opera or who likes to sing even. And then they get to come to this, you know, little little town in the middle of Ohio and and hang out with 30 kids who are pretty much like them. And I think that 
is a life-changing experience for so many of them. Um, when I get to you know, read all the thank you notes afterwards or you know, read the survey results that we send out, I hear so many times, you know, this, these were the best two weeks of my life and yeah. you know, thank you for changing my life and, and, and giving me this friend group you know, they all have text message groups from years ago that they mm -hmm. still are a part of. So they still have their network of singers that they that they found in the that they found in the in the summer program. When I was a cherub, each one of us got the parting gift of a book, an actual book that one can hold and <laughs> and read and treasure and so on. And all the faculty would write in the front of the book, not just sign their name, but write to each one of us something memorable and they tried to pick books that they felt would be of particular interest to the person in question or that might expand them further in directions that they'd not yet explored at the chair program my book was by the famous new york times critic and writer walter kerr called tragedy and comedy and every faculty member wrote in the book about what that book meant to them uh, what it might mean to me. And now it's it's practically coming apart, but I've preserved it and I keep it because there was so much love that was put into that choice by them. And when I talk to other cherub colleagues, they too remember their book that they got. And I mentioned this only to you, I don't know what, if anything, is your parting gift to them, but um, that was such a wonderful treasurable gesture in a way that i'm just suggesting that for one thing um i noticed by the way among the many that i'll read them private voice lessons private vocal coaching master classes with guest faculty acting workshops stage scenes and songs connecting with the text very important introduction to the international phonetic alphabet italian german diction college audition workshop excellent vocal health clinic historical performance class alexander technique and beginning yoga talk you can talk about any but i want you to start by talking about the introduction to the international phonetic alphabet what is that so uh, that is, for short it's ipa and for those who don't know it's it's the way to spell out how things sound so singers learn uh, special symbols for vowels and consonants, and then we can use that to learn how to pronounce other languages other than our own. Uh, I can tell you that having worked with many British trained singers, not that they're necessarily British, they might be from Canada, South Africa, New Zealand, Finland, just to name the ones I've worked with, um, in England, when they teach Italian and use IPA, the letter E, as in Emily, is not pronounced A, like amore, mm -hmm. but it's pronounced amori. And I always know someone who's British trained because she, if she's singing me, me, or whatever, might not say amore, but amori. Really? Yeah. And I, plead with them to say it amore per favore not per favori <laughs> i disagree with that diction teacher who taught them that <laughs> no, and i she's a very very famous teacher who's produced magnificent sopranos mostly magnificent uh -huh. some of the world's best you heard me mention the countries i think you can figure it out but uh <laughs> but um it's i know of the ipa of course but i just found it so interesting that an individual teacher can go her own way and be a fantastic teacher. And these are like markers on them, on yeah. the students that they work with, that you know who worked with that particular teacher. <laughs> um, I want to commend a book to you, if you don't know it, for your vocal health clinic called Vocal Health for Singers by Dr. Anthony F. Yan, J-A-H-N. He was my guest on this program a couple of years ago. He used to be the medical director of the Metropolitan Opera. And he heads a clinic and he has, he's not the only ENT, ear, nose and throat doctor that has clients who are singers, but he's one of the foremost. And he trained in Vienna where that a lot of this tradition began. Um, and it's Vocal Health for Singers is a wonderful book that 
you don't have to give it to every one of your students. I wouldn't give it to any of them because <laughs> it suggests that they're not in good health, but on your reading list for the kids. Exactly. No, thank you for that. Yeah, because that absolutely is important. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're doing, say, connecting with the text, which I consider essential and important, again, and we're talking about high school students, we have the issue of topics that are either a bit mature or topics that might, we hope, be beyond the life experience of these young people, because if it is part of their life experience and they've had some trauma, um, because let's not pretend if you read the poems in a Schubert song and lead, um, a lot of them are pretty dramatic and not just Schubert, but let's start with Schubert. Mm -hmm. um, how, what are the keys that all of you use to unlock this in a way that is, I hate the word, but you'll understand relevant but without being traumatic? Well, let me start with the connecting with the text part of, of what we do at SVI. Uh, that part of our program is led by Dr. Liza Kelly from Western Kentucky University. She is a wonderful mezzo-soprano and stage director. We studied together at CCM in Cincinnati and have uh, worked together for many years. And she um, has put together a curriculum throughout her years of teaching specifically designed to help young singers explore their own artistry. And um, she even wrote a handbook about it all. And, and so her curriculum that she uses, a lot of the connecting with the text, number one, has to do with doing the basic kitchen table work of translation. And, and her steps of translation are um, you know, in a worksheet, you write down the text word by word, each one gets a box, mm -hmm. and then it's the word by word translation. Mm -hmm. And then you put um, the poetic translation, and then you put the translation as it means to you in your own language. Mm -hmm. And I think that works really well with, I mean, with any age of singer, but it's yeah. specifically the young singer. Um, because sometimes they come into into class and and you know we've we've all had the the 24 Italian songs and arias where the English translations in there but it doesn't really mean the Italian mm -hmm. and you have to go in and, and make sure you're you're putting the right English word with the with the Italian word so that's really step one for them but I mean I, that fourth step of of making sure that you understand the translation and understand the poetry is 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 super important for the young singer, any singer. Um, and then Dr. Kelly also takes it a step farther and she puts um, stage movement into it and subtext and and just creating the whole performance atmosphere for for a song or an aria if they're working on an aria. So in the case where there might be humor built into the text, but also into the music. I, I'm thinking specifically not of Rossini opera arias, but of Rossini songs that he wrote, uh, the gondolier songs for a young woman, um, where number one, it's in Venetian accent, if not dialect. And the, the, the sort of lisping, hissing sound that's built into the words Rossini knew what he was doing <laughs> with uh -huh. that. And secondly, the flirtation that if it's overt, if it's Carmen is over the top, but just a certain kind of knowing sensuality, call it happiness of, you know, you could picture her sitting in the sun with the handsome gondoliers rowing by. And I don't like that one. I don't like that one. That one. Maybe. And it's all very subtle, the way it's built in that way. And there's so, I mean, as a song can become a world. Baller said a symphony is a world. I would say that a song could be a world. And you can play these things your whole life. Someone like Renata Tibaldi did those gondolier songs. And I never felt she quite got them because <laughs> she uh, musically very, very solid. 
Cecilia Bartley does those songs and there's so much more going on because she has done that work. Um, and there are others as well. Marilyn Horn did it beautifully, but with a little more American sassiness, whereas Cecilia Bartley might be Italian uh, coquettishness. You, you pick the words, but I love the, and maybe I got ahead of you, but once they've done this charting of the, of the text, then what do they do to build the performance? Well, then, you know, once they've done that work, then they have the freedom to make choices. I think that's, that's what we want to give them. You know, there's not one clear way that works for everyone. And I think as a young singer, you, you get told how to do things by a lot of different professors. And, you know, you can go from a voice lesson where they say, sing it or do it like this, and you change it. And then you go to a coach and they say the exact opposite. Um, so then this young singer has to make a musical choice. And I think that's what those classes are all about is, is experimenting with how you can handle the language, the performance, the stage movement, how far you can go, how little you can do and still make a difference. Uh, or still make an impact, maybe is a better word. Um, and and that's what those two weeks are for. And then, you know, we always have a culminating performance where we get to see the progress that they've made. And I think for a lot of them, it gives them a renewed sense of confidence in mm -hmm. their own ability and their own musicianship as well. So when I was the chair of a Northwestern, many of us then thought we wanted to go study at Northwestern. Mm -hmm. Not all of us did. Some did, but not all of us. Um, do the students who come to, uh, let me get this right, Oxford, Ohio from Miami University of Ohio, yeah. which is not the University of Miami, Florida, but Miami University of Ohio in yeah. Oxford, Ohio. When they come to Oxford, Ohio, do they then think, hmm, maybe I'd like to study here? Is there then the thread for those who want to? Some of them do. Um, there have been a, a, probably a handful over the last few years that have. Um, I would say the average is maybe one out of 30 per year um, because I accept um, singers who have already graduated from high school. So they're rising college freshmen. So they've already made their college choices. Probably mm -hmm. half the group is, is that age group. So, I mean, there's, there's half of them that are going off to all parts of the country, some Oberlin, some Juilliard, um, some CCM here in Cincinnati, but Miami does, does get a handful and they, they actually have a lot of people apply, um, which I think is a, is a boost for them as well. I wonder if you know a professor there who I have great admiration for, and yet, because I've never said her last name, I may pronounce it wrong. Her first name is Andrea, and her last name is spelled R-I-D-I-L-L-A. Is it Radilla? Uh, Radilla? Yeah, Radilla. Okay. Yeah. So Andrea is an oboist. And she's a wonderful world-class oboist who goes oboeing when she's not teaching. But she also teaches the opera class at Miami of Ohio and uses my book, Opera 101, as the text. And every year pre-pandemic, the class would come to New York and attend an opera that I would help prepare them for. We'd meet at Juilliard and we'd visit mm -hmm. Juilliard. And then we'd take a rehearsal space and I would conduct a two-hour class about opera, about their interest in opera, and about the opera they're, they're about to attend, which I usually attend with them at the Met. Um, what I always began with with these students is, what's your major? What is your connection to music? Do you plan for music to be your career? And I would say that of the 30 or so who came each year, that maybe five had plans for musical career, but they all took Andrea Rodilla's course because it was a very well-regarded course and because they got a trip to New York. Mm -hmm. And because um, Andrea found that having students who may be business majors or um, accounting majors or political science majors or gender issues majors, whatever it is, that they teach one another in the context of opera. 
and to me, part of what's fantastic about opera is it's about us, it's about the whole world. So that someone planning to do a degree in psychology or business, someone could do business and look at the ring and see Votan as in effect being a businessman making tough choices or stupid choices. And then the psychology student would come in with someone else, with something else. And then the gender <laughs> um, major would come in and bring all those important issues. Um, and it's, it was wonderful every year to see these students, many of whom I've kept in touch with through the years because they've gone on to do great things, most of them not in opera. But um, I, I bring this up in part because I wonder, have you worked with Andrea Radilla and have you met her opera students? And talk about that side, because I only teach them in New York, not Ohio. Yeah, I haven't um, been a part of that class, but um, I was on adjunct faculty at Miami for a number of years, not since I became executive director of Schmidt Vocal Arts, but I did have the pleasure of performing with Andrea. We did a concert of um, the Handel German uh, Neun Deutsche Arien, or like oratorio pieces with organ and oboe and soprano. So. Uh, we got to work together then um and i think she's still teaching the class i'm not sure if they traveled this year to they did not because not. of the kind of, yeah yeah hopefully hopefully next I year hope so. <laughs> um so related question isn't Handel the most underrated of all composers <laughs> you know what um i love singing Handel. i hate describing any plot lines that have to do yeah. with the opera <laughs> Well, I don't just mean opera. It's kind of like anything he turned to was brilliant. Yeah. And I, exciting yeah. and has what Marilyn Horn uses the word all the time. It has schwung, which mm -hmm. means it has kind of movement and, and cadence. And, you know, yeah. you can't sit still listening to Handel, which is kind of thrilling mm -hmm. because yeah. he composed across such a broad spectrum of subject matter and instrumentation and he did all of his oratorios and more religious things, but then did fantastic, very sexy operas. There's no opera sexier than Agrippina, for example. Yeah. yeah. And so, so if you are introducing your young singers to Italian, I know that you use Mozart or Handel. Mm -hmm. Those are very different approaches, obviously, because Handel tends to be about very few words, but vocal improvisation, variation, and so on, often not completely written into the score, whereas Mozart tends to be linked to dramatic moments that move very fast and are very hard to do and require uh, rapid alterations that are not just about showiness of the voice, but about dramatic expression. Mm -hmm. If a student proposes and Mozart already and you think she'd be better with a handle or vice versa. How, how, based on your getting to know the student somewhat before she comes to Ohio, how do you guide her toward one or the other? Oh, that's a hard question. I, I would, can I add something into the mix besides um, Handel and Mozart? So in, in our category of Italian art song and arias, I kind of put Handel and Mozart as the the extreme on one end, where I would say the majority actually bring art songs by Donaudi or um, or pieces from the from the twenty four Italian songs and arias that are that are really great for young voices mm -hmm. and a good start um, if they haven't had a lot of Italian pieces. So the ones that do bring arias. Um, Usually we limit them to Handel Mozart. Sometimes Donizetti gets in there, um, depending on if they're a young tenor <laughs> or a soprano. Um, and I, you know, even with those arias, I I'm very very cautious about giving um, arias too soon to young singers. So. Um, if, a, if a teacher really wants them to sing the Vieni, I, I, I might don't think figured out by Susanna, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which is deceptively hard. Like you think, oh, it's just like, dun, 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 dun. and mm -hmm. but no. <laughs> and it and concludes the whole, the whole opera practically, yeah. and therefore yeah. has to 
incorporate all of that within its performance. Yeah. It's not like the Non So Piu Cosa Son Cosa Faccia, which comes at the beginning of Leno City Figaro mm-hmm. and is just an expression of a moment. Yeah. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah. So, I mean, they're, 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 over the years, there have been a few that can sing it very well. Mm-hmm. Um, I tend to stick with. Uh, well, we had a mezzo who sang um, Voi Que Sapete this year, and, and it was b- beautiful. She mm-hmm. will sing that role someday. So I'm glad that she was able to work on it. Um, we have a lot of singers, sopranos especially, who bring in Despina or, or Celina, which also are not easy, but no. um, they are, um, it's a good exercise in in Italian and in creating a character, especially for Despina Arias, I think. Um, well, Despina, for people who may not know immediately who we're talking about, is, quote, the maid in Così Fan Tutte, but she's also the engineer of much of the action in the plot. Exactly. And she, it's a class thing, and it's an intelligence thing. She's more intelligent than the women she works for, but she's, quote, of a lower class, and is treated that way by everyone. And you know, I always feel bad for Despina, and I've seen productions of Cosi Fantute that very brilliantly cast not a 25-year-old, but a 65-year-old in the role, because then she's a woman of experience, and she works for these two young women, but can explain to them as an experienced woman, rather than a girl of their same age, who in a way is competing for the attraction of men, but is not qualified, quote, qualified, because she's a servile person and not a lady, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Similarly, Zerlina in Don Giovanni is a working class girl, as opposed to the Donnas, the ladies, Anna and Elvira. And those are tough. And frankly, it brings us right into issues that I think we have to talk about with young people, about class orientation, which is a very different thing in Britain than it is in the United States, where in Britain they talk openly about class and they accept what they're saying without being aghast at how awful that can often sound. In America, we talk about things like income levels or being, quote, disadvantaged. And I try to tell every young person that whatever gift they have, they are advantaged. And that we're not supposed to all have all the same gifts. I was a lousy basketball player. So if you want to say I was disadvantaged because I could not get the ball into the hoop, big deal. I was a better athlete in other sports. And we tend to focus on what we don't do well or as well as other people. Mm -hmm. And I try with anyone, but especially young people, to make them understand, look at the gifts you have. Look at the knowledge you have. You've been accepted in this program, in this vocal institute, because you are special. And, you know, unfortunately, and maybe you encounter this too, when I work with very young people, master classes and other contexts, they apologize all the time. They always say, sorry, sorry, sorry. Don't apologize. We all make mistakes. We learn through our mistakes. You're not required to apologize every minute. Apologize once. Let's have a global I'm sorry and then put it to the side. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Because, but I mean, I'm I'm not criticizing young people. What I'm saying is that something has happened in recent years that maybe in your generation, in my generation, we apologize where we had to apologize. (laughs) In your generation, I don't know, but younger people now apologize constantly. And I worry about that. I worry about their mental health because, you know, you and I and other people do this kind of thing are being handed delicate, precious entities that we have a responsibility for forming and giving them hope and confidence, but without false hope. As you said, you know, not all of them will go on to become singers. But nonetheless, this education, this experience they're getting is valuable for other reasons. So the question is, how do you deal with frailty among your high school students? 
Um, I think that goes number one back to kindness. Um, and I think for our organization, we we really try and level the playing field. So um, if we're going back to class and income and stuff, it, we try and level the playing field so no one feels like um, they're not worthy to be there. Um, our organization is, is big on scholarships. So for this two week program, you know, if a family can't really afford the tuition, they can apply for financial aid. And we don't want it to ever be a burden to come to one of our programs. So we mm -hmm. always have need-based aid. And that that's actually become a huge part of our programs for, for college scholarships. We support about 50 or 60 kids at the university level, mm -hmm. um, anywhere from $1,000 a year to $30,000 a year, depending mm -hmm. on their need. And, and that has always been a driving force for the foundation to, to, you know, to help those singers really um, follow their dreams, but not have to have the financial burden that comes along with it because opera is expensive. Yep. Study music's expensive. Yep. Um, so if if the frailty frailty has to do with worries about money, we definitely try and eliminate that right away. And um, that program is going to be continuing continuing on that scholarship program. Uh, if the frailty has to do with the confidence in their own voice, then we try and help them find ways to to overcome any issues that they might have. Obviously, we're not we're not their therapists or anything like that. Um, but I think good teaching and a good support system can do wonders. Even in two weeks, mm -hmm. it can it can give a teenager a boost that they might need mm -hmm. to you know have a successful audition season in the fall. It might also help convince the parents of the teenager that this is something that they could go into at the university level. That often mm -hmm. happens at our competitions where a parent will come up to us and say, say I can't believe my, my, my son or my daughter won first place. Like I had no idea they were this good. <laughs> and yeah. say, yes, they are that good. <laughs> You're reminding me that when I was a cherub, I had a friend there, another one I've remained in touch with for all of his 50, all of these 50 years. And he's a wonderful father. Um, originally from Indiana, but living in Tennessee, who raised four kids and his daughter shows great musical promise. And I've been helping the daughter and the father sort of find their way into that. And she got into Indiana University. Now that's where she'll be going in the fall in the vocal arts program. Wonderful. And uh, she certainly showed talent in high school musicals, but that's very different from what she'll be doing at IU with Carol Van Ness. So, uh, yeah. We'll have to do our undergraduate competition. <laughs> yes, I, I, I will pass that along. I, I'm not kidding, I will pass that along. Um, but another question came to my mind is purely a logistical one. Among your high schoolers, what is their living, their accommodation set up? Do they have live in dorms? Do they have roommates? How does that work? Um, they live in really nice dorms, much nicer than the dorms that I had at college. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's there's some new dorms that are right next to the music buildings at Miami University. And oftentimes in the past, we have had them in roommate situations and we would do kind of questionnaires. What kind of roommate do you like? The past two years, we've actually put people in singles just for COVID. Yeah. In case we need to separate someone. So they all had single rooms this year and they have I have a staff that stays in the dorms with them. So they have some RAs like they would have in college, too. Uh, I asked because as a cherub, they would pair us off with someone who would be the most unlikely roommate really? so that we were, in effect, forced to learn to adapt and be different. So my roommate was a farm boy named John from Southern Illinois. Uh -huh. We'd never been north to Chicago or Evanston. And here I was a New York boy from Manhattan. And we were the most unlikely pair, but we had to learn to get along. I mean, we did get along, but just everything, even things like the hour that he turned the light off as a farm boy, 
was very different from the, the light, the hour that I turned the light off as a Manhattan kid, which is to say me would be two in the morning and for him it would be nine in the evening. And That's you learn exactly about the people. What we do. <laughs> Pardon me? That's exactly the opposite about what we do. I think it's because we want singers to be sleeping at the same time. Compatibility, so I know. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't think they planned that, but they just thought, what could be more different than a guy who grew up in a farm growing soybeans, by the way, mm -hmm. and a kid from the Upper West Side of Manhattan? And that we would have to learn to live with one another. I'm not saying we didn't get along, but we had to learn. We had to sort out who the other one was and make accommodations for the other one. It was good. It was great. Yeah. But um, they intentionally did that, which I thought was fascinating. I too understand why you would want to create compatibility from the start. <laughs> <laughs> Especially with only two weeks, you know, yeah. you don't want any fights happening I after day so. three. <laughs> I think so. Um, so now we did I leave anything out about the high school program that you would like me to address or shall we move up to the next level? Um, I think we covered the Institute pretty well. Um, okay. Hopefully we'll have a good crop of singers next year too. So give us the website. How do people apply? By what time do they have to apply? So the website is schmidtvocalarts.org. Schmidt is spelled S-C-H-M-I-D-T. And uh, we open our applications um, every year in in August. So it, the season announcement happens and then um, they can apply for all of our competitions throughout the year. And um, for, the S, for the Institute, those deadlines usually pop up in March. And uh, the competition applications are, are on a rolling basis, depending mm -hmm. on w which one you apply for. So now let's move up to the next level and college and university and competitions. How are the young people you meet when they're 20 and 21 and 22 different musically and emotionally from the high schoolers? Well, so I should preface this with right now, our, our college undergraduate competition is still only online because we okay. started it in 2020 um, as a pandemic project. Um, but I do know a handful of them because they are, a lot of them are alumni of our high school programs who end up applying. Um, but I, we decided intentionally to have that undergraduate competition open to everyone um, because we know that our high school programs don't reach every corner of the United States yet. So we didn't want to limit to just alumni. Um, and that, that first year, we had so many great singers apply. Uh, we had 120 spots that got snapped up in 20 minutes where we were shocked. Our website was basically down. Um, mm -hmm. And we had, what we decided to do for our undergrad competition too is do it kind of like um, Met Opera Council style where we had four equal winners instead of- um, Explain that in detail for people who don't know. Yes, yeah, so the Metropolitan Opera Council, now the LaFont competition, I believe, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So at the at the final level, um, when you make the finals, then they announce equal winners instead of ranking them one, two, three. Um, I think sometimes they choose four or five or six even. In As the Met, it's been either five or six for the past few years. Yeah. And uh, we decided to go with four. Uh, four equal winners. The first year we did four equal $5,000 winners. And we had uh, first years competing against fourth years. So it was all mixed together. And crazily enough, we had two first year college students win mm. out of 120 singers, which um, I was just amazed at. I mean, there were two, two of our alumni uh, so I knew who they were, and one of them won this competition only singing art songs. He didn't even offer an aria. A wonderful tenor from Juilliard, and um, and he, he's always been just so artistically sound. And it was just like he just kept getting increment, like just such every year better and better and better. Mm -hmm. And so I was happy to see him when. 
and I think with the undergrad singers, you just see a little bit more finesse in their technique, of course. Um, the older you get, the, the, especially in the male voices, I think um, you get a little more settled into your voice. I mean, with some of them with the big voices, they won't be settled for at least another 10 years, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you do see that with the with the higher voices and and um, the women and artistically, I think they just they have a little bit more detail in what they're saying. Um, you know, it's it's the whole watching everything on video during the pandemic has changed a lot of singers, I think. Mm -hmm. um, Number one, you can, you know, re-record <laughs> until, <Yes. laughs> until it's really great. Um, and, and you also, think you any know, of them play with the knobs at all to hold a high note or to go uh, That's not allowed in our competition. Flat tune. <laughs> so, no, no auto tune in ours. Um, yeah, but it's, it's like you, you, you get used to being able to do things more than once. Um, you also have to pay attention because, you know, the camera is really close to your face as opposed to being in the back of the room. So you get that, um, that practice as well. Uh, so you, you see some more, art, some more musical and artistic choices, I think, from an undergraduate singer. Um, this past, the second year we did it, um, we actually uh, divided the freshmen and sophomores and the juniors and seniors into two different divisions just because we, we thought the demand was so high that, you know, we might as well. So now we have four or $5,000 winners in the higher level and four $3,000 winners in the lower division. Um, and we're planning on, on continuing that competition as well. So, and maybe expanding it in the future. So here's <laughs> another tech issue because you are dealing with the intermediation of zoom and tech and all of these things as you and i are now speaking via zoom um you are by far the best lit guest i've had in two and a half years <laughs> and not only the foreground but the background everything is perfectly done and i've not encountered this myself included we do it in our homes and i have sunlight coming in from the west <laughs> and as the day moves along and the seasons change and sometimes it's bright in here and other times not and i just lights on and off like that yeah. uh -huh. and um but yours i'm gonna need to consult with you do you teach your students about this technology as well which i think frankly is a fundamental at this point as part of their audition process um, you know what, we, we haven't yet. We've, we put some tips like on our website for getting the best video quality and audio quality. We don't, we don't offer a class, but I might steal that um, and yeah. <laughs> offer it this year. But, you know, I'm lucky. This is all natural lighting in my house. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> I'm coming. I actually, I freaked out. I freaked out about an hour and a half ago because I thought I, I left my selfie light in my office. So mm -hmm. I was I was wandering around my condo figuring out where the best light was. No, you it. got it. Um, <laughs> no, but it's so important because the perception of an audition or of someone in the conversation varies a lot. I've had exceedingly experienced world class guests in their fields who sort of sit hunched like this <laughs> or they move around a lot and they are really just not aware of that. And I, I've been remarkably impressed not only with all the things you describe and how you describe them, but the actual framing here of you has been perfect in terms of left and right and light angles and no glare and everything. Well, thanks. <laughs> so absolutely, thank you. But I mean, I do think that it may be something worth working in. I've yeah. taught a class for the Martina Royal Foundation for CCM for uh, University of Colorado Boulder called Media, Social Media and the Opera Singer or the Musician, mm -hmm. because it is so much a part of their world in a way that it was not part of mine or even yours, yeah. um, that they have to be knowledgeable and they have to know about 
the advantages it can confer, but also, frankly, the hazards. Um, not too long ago, back in July, a world famous opera singer put a rather stupid post on Facebook that he then came to regret. And he issued an apology. And I think that he did a lot of damage to himself. And he is a magnificent singer and artist. And he posted something very stupid. And if someone of that stature could be so intemperate to write those things, whether he believed them or not, and I hope he didn't, um, younger people for whom social media is like mother's milk, it comes at the very beginning of their lives, don't necessarily understand. I'll take another example. We're not, I don't name people, as you know. A world famous, wonderful singer. He's a wonderful man, in addition to being a wonderful singer. I admire him greatly, who has starred in leading roles at the Met in Chicago and elsewhere. A number of years ago, was in sort of a singer's room on Facebook or an opera room where we tend to gather. And he described the medical issues he was having and the vocal challenges and the breathing. And he described it in rather graphic detail. I think looking for sympathy and to share, and we all love this man, um, but it led to his not getting contracts for a while. And I contacted him privately and I said, you know, you're one of our grades, but if you do that, even at your stature, and this is pre-pandemic, management is going to be hesitant to hire you if they feel that you may not be able to appear. So I'm going to advise you to write, went to my doctor, it was nothing, it was all sorted out. And then you can make the choices. I was mistaken, I was over anxious, whatever. And then you can have control of your career, make the choices you want about what to sing, where and when. And in the many years since, he's never posted another medical detail about his life and work. And he has gone on to really become one of our great artists. So I say this because young people just don't know. And they put things on social media, even innocently with the best intention. I don't mean hate speech or meanness. I just mean things about themselves like, bummer today i'm really sad well i'm sorry you can't say that <laughs> save it for the stage is is our line and take that sadness and work it into your interpretation of your hugo wolf song mm -hmm. but not for not for public media consumption and documentation for all times yeah and and i, I we did a social media workshop with um uh Elizabeth Files, I am going to name her because she's fabulous <laughs> from uh, from our PR group. And and one of her main um, main things for singers um, that she told them is make sure you you know what's out there about you as far as even the vo your videos of your voice and and performances from five years ago or six or ten. And if it's if it's not something that represents you as you are now, then then um, maybe ask to have it taken down. I mean, someone has a copy somewhere, but at least it's not the, the first thing that people search for. I knew, I know a fellow, a bass baritone who was in the Paris Opera Atelier, their young artist program. Outstanding, they gave him the prize for the best student of his group. And he had early in his career, a couple of not very good videos of him singing i think it was leporello or figaro i think it was leporello and um it didn't show him well and he wasn't getting work even though he graduated at the top at the paris opera and i said to him take try to get them taken down it's not easy because yes they exist out there um because number one it's you 15 years ago and number two You've done a lot of wonderful things since, but if they're thinking of you for Leporello, they're going to look at that one. Yeah. But if they're thinking of you for Malmetto Secondo, then they'll find you doing that. Um, I know that you have a lot of work in front of you and that you only have a couple of more minutes. I'm a social media fanatic in terms of sticking to time. Is there anything that I have left out, Linda McAllister, that you would like me to address or that you would like to address? 
Uh, I, well, first of all, I just want to thank you for having me on your program. It's been a delight to talk to you. And I, I think I just would love to leave with your audience that, you know, if they, if they know a young singer in their area, please have them take a look at our programs. You know, we're, we're there for as many people as possible. We want as many young singers to be exposed to music and to our wonderful network of artists that we have across the country. Um, any, you know, we have, we have professors at universities, pianists, world-renowned singers working with our organization. And it's such a pleasure to have all of those, those people in our corner and um, helping support the next generation of singers. And we just hope that we can be there to, to help not only support them um, in programs, but also support them financially as they pursue their careers. So with that, please repeat again the website. Yes, so schmidtvocalarts.org. Schmidt is S-C-H-M-I-D-T. Vocal Arts, A-R-T-S dot O-R-G. Yep. And as I thought your listeners know, I always ask my guests to recommend performances from the Idajo collection that particularly appeal to them. And what Linda has done is particular because they're all favorites of hers, but she also has indicated that these artists are favorites of some of their recent alumni. Uh, so I'll just name the artists, Joyce D. Donato, Frederica Von Stata, Bryn Turvel, Maria Callas, Lorraine Hunt, Lieberson, Julius Drake, Nadine Sierra, Charlotte Bowden, all wonderful artists, all singing wonderful music. And as I began this program, I said there are people in our field, in our business, I hate the word, but it is sometimes business, that do fundamental, essential work that makes opera happen, but they don't always get noticed or seen. And that's why, Linda McAllister, I was very grateful that you arrived beautifully lit, beautifully spoken. <laughs> <laughs> And have introduced many of us, myself included, to a reality that we don't know about. And therefore, thank you and keep up the good work. Thank you.